Hello and welcome to this video on gross negligence manslaughter. Another type of involuntary manslaughter. There is another video for unlawful act manslaughter as well, should you wish to view that. So to start us off, we need to consider what gross negligence manslaughter is. It is, of course, a type of involuntary manslaughter. Um, it is only charged at manslaughter, as we discussed in the video on unlawful act manslaughter. But it's another way of proving it. So gross negligence manslaughter then is committed where a defendant owes a victim a duty of care but breaches that duty in a negligent way and causes the death of a victim. So it th therefore can be committed by an act or an omission and in itself the behaviour doesn't have to be unlawful. So the key case we need to use for every explanation, every application of gross negligence manslaughter is the case of Adam Arco. Now in this case the defendant was an anaesthetist during an operation, a tube to help the victim breathe came out and was not noticed for nine minutes. Therefore, the heart stopped and an alarm sounded. Now, the victim died and was charged. the defendant was charged at manslaughter. It was held in this case a reasonable anaesthetist would have noticed this and acted to save the victim. And what this case did is give us the elements for gross negligence manslaughter. So what we've got, Adam Marco set out these elements. Uh, there must be a duty of care between the defendant and the victim. There must be then a breach of that duty and this breach must cause death. So the first three elements there, one, two and A and B, are normal negligence except the cause, uh, causation element has death in it. The difference between gross negligence manslaughter and negligence in civil law is these latter two elements. So gross negligence which the jury considers to be criminal and a risk of death. So what we've got there, we break this down into each element and we're going to look at each in turn. We're going to consider what duty of care is, breach of duty, uh, cause and death, negligence is gross and the risk of death as we go through. So we are first going to look at duty of care. Now remember most of the principles you studied in negligence in civil law apply. What we're going to do though is look at this in the context of death and unlawful and manslaughter. So a duty of care then is outlined at Adam Marco. Now, Roughly, the Caparo test still applies, so damage is foreseeable, there's proximity between the defendant and victim, and it must be fair, just and reasonable to propose a duty of care. But as you'll know at this point, uh, the test itself isn't used necessarily to the same degree after Robinson. Um, if there's an established duty, then there's an established duty, but of course, we're going to also look at what the particular rules are for this particular crime. So, uh, it doesn't need to be done in the same detail as ordinary negligence. Um, we just say there is a duty, that's enough. We'll look through these elements and, and there should be enough rather than going through those tests. Now, in criminal law, it's enough to suggest there's a duty as damage is foreseeable or the victim is closely affected by the actions as outlined in Donahue. So, it is a very basic duty laid out. Remember, there is no good Samaritan law, the same as well, consistently for criminal and civil law. Now we're going to look at these two elements, so for example the defendant may have assumed a duty, we're going to look at the case of Ruffle and where a duty can be assumed even if a crime is being committed. And we can also look at where the duty is placed because of a state of affairs. So we're going to look at all of those in the next couple of seconds. So we can use the case of Bateman as an authority because of course in this case this involved a duty of care between doctors and patients. So you can look at the case of the fact but ultimately you need it to prove the idea of a doctor-patient relationship, a duty would already apply and some are automatic. In Ruffle, uh, the defendant and the victim were friends in this case and when the victim overdosed on opioids, the defendant tried to revive him but when he couldn't, he left him on his uh, mother's doorstep where he then died. And it was held in this case, the defendant did owe a duty of care as he'd assumed responsibility for him when he tried to revive him. And you can consider this once you start trying to help somebody if they go on to die, then you potentially, in this situation, could be liable for manslaughter. In Wacker, this gives us the impression that you could be guilty of unlawful act manslaughter or have a duty of care, even if you're involved in criminal activity. So in this case, the defendant transported illegal immigrants in his lobby and they died. So a defendant can owe a person a duty, even if they're involved in criminal activity. So to look at some more examples of where there was a duty of care, you may remember two of these cases, Pitwood and Stone and Dobinson, from looking at elements of a crime. So in Pitwood there was a duty because of a contract when the defendant fails to close the level crossing um, and of course death occurred. 
and in Stone and Dobbinson there was a duty because of a special relationship. That will always apply. Now, of course, Browning is a new case, or possibly a new case to you. So there's no duty in this case, or was no duty from landlord to drinker when the drinker drank too much and died as a result. And in Willoughby, the deci decision in this case was that a judge can direct there is a duty, and that will be sufficient. And of course, then it's over to, for the rest of the elements to be proven by the prosecution. Now, with respect to omissions, where the defendant is in a special duty situation, he may be liable on the basis of omission rather than the positive act, which is consistent, as we know, with negligence. So it might be the case that the defendant creates a state of affairs, and when creating a state of affairs, they then have an obligation to do something. If they fail to do something, this is giving them a duty to do it, then they may be guilty of a crime. So we can look to the cases of Miller, we can look to the case of Evans, for example, which illustrate this. So Miller was the extent of principle, this idea of creating a dangerous situation, though this was an arson case, of course the principle could apply. But in Evans, the defendant argued she didn't owe a duty of care to her half-sister after supplying her with drugs, and the victim took drugs and died. So what this did with respect to creating a state of affairs and possibly creating a duty of care was led to two approaches. The first is that the duty might arise if the defendant was aware or ought to have been aware that the victim's life was at risk and one of any of the following applies. So the defendant contributed by supply, for example, if they give some drugs, if the defendant was in a relationship, such as parent to child, if the defendant and victim were engaged in a dangerous joint enterprise which went wrong so we've seen this in examples past exam questions where for example the people were at burglary on premise committing burglary on premises and when trying to escape uh, leaving the friend to die now this could be applicable in that situation and of course if the defendant voluntarily assumes a duty of care as they did in ruffle it might even be though that if something in addition to the supply of drugs was required, then some such aftercare or responsibility, though not thought of being voluntarily some such responsibility in itself, nevertheless amounted to some acknowledgement of responsibility on the part of the defendant. So what we got then is this idea that if it's not any of the four listed on the left hand side, then the jury must be decided to left to decide the facts, including questions as if the defendant did supply the drugs, if it's a drugs case, did he or she feel that he was responsible for the aftercare? Whether or not those facts a duty arises is for the judge to decide. So in, in essence, a judge can direct the jury that there is a duty of care, the same as in Willoughby. So as ever, once we've established a duty of care, we then need to see if there is a breach of this duty of care. So the normal rules from breach of duty apply with respect to outlining the reasonable person standard and then of course looking at the circumstances and risk factors to consider whether the person's fallen below their duty. Uh, what we've got though of course it obviously rises in the case of professionals, for example doctors, we know learner status is irrelevant and it's highly unlikely in these kinds of cases that you're going to, in, in the A-level, you're going to get a child committing manslaughter in your problem questions. But of course, if they did, then of course the standard of care is lower for that person. So all of the normal rules of breach of duty apply. So once we've established duty of care, breach of duty, we need to consider the rules on causation. But we need to make sure that we're aware that death is caused as a result. So we're now going to discuss causing death. So of course, we've got factual causation, the before test, before the actions of the defendant, would the outcome, the death, have occurred? And we've got legal causation. So legal causation for this is a slight difference because you might be tempted to, co to consider causation from a civil perspective, given its negligence, but the criminal rules apply. So for legal causation, we use the minimus rule, we use the more than minimal test or the more than trifling link Kim said we need to make sure we use the criminal law rules. In addition to these, we need to consider the multiple causes. We need to consider the Novus Actus Intervenien and of course a thin school rule if they apply. And two new cases with respect to causation for unlawful act manslaughter. We have Armstrong. Now in this case, it couldn't be proven that the defendant's negligence caused death. But in Dalloway, this was a case in which a, a young girl ran out in front of a horse and cart. Now, the driver of the cart didn't have hold of the reins. Now, what it was shown that in this case, even if the 
had hold of the reins, the horse still would have hit the child so they didn't cause the death. So it must be shown that if the defendant showed proper care, the victim would not have died. So once we've established the three elements of, of negligence essentially, we need to consider the differences between ordinary civil negligence and gross negligence manslaughter. So the fourth element is that the negligence is gross. Now this just means serious. So gross negligence uh, means the fact that the defendant has been negligent is not enough, to, of course, to convict him of gross negligence manslaughter. Not every case in which there is negligence and a death is going to be gross negligence manslaughter, but the negligence has to be gross. Now, usually it, it must be proved that the breach involved a risk of death, which we're going to come to in a moment. So the question then is, what is exactly gross negligence? Now, according to Adamarco, our key case for gross negligence manslaughter, it's for the jury to decide that having regard to the risk of death involved, whether the conduct of a defendant was so bad in all the circumstances that it amounts to a criminal act or omission. So what this means is gross negligence may include any of the three bullet points here. So an indifference to an obvious risk uh, of injury to health or a foresight of this risk and running it nonetheless or appreciation of the risk and an intention to avoid it, but the intention to avoid it, or the attempt to avoid it, can be done with such negligence that it's deserving of criminal punishment, or serious failure to address an obvious risk, which goes beyond mere inadvertence. So it can be any of those, but of course we've got a development here to an extent. So a case of Andrew says, a gross negligence is a high degree of negligence. Bateman developed this a little and said disregard for human life or safety that the conduct merits criminal punishment is gross negligence and Adamarco tells us that it's so bad the negligence in the circumstances as to amount to criminal negligence and ultimately it's a matter for the jury. A couple more examples of negligence so we've got Edwards in 2001 the defendants here allowed the seven-year-olds to play on the railway bridge and they'd shut their eyes to an obvious and serious danger or had decided to take the risk and this was considered to be gross negligence. In Finlay, uh, the scout fell to his death on Snowden and the scout leader was acquitted and he did not he did not show such a regard for life and safety in this particular case so was acquitted. In Hood, uh, the defendant was found guilty of manslaughter on the basis he'd failed to get medical attention for his wife for two weeks and in Woods and Hodgson the defendants were found not guilty after a child found and swallowed ecstasy tablets hidden in their house because they had tried to hide them so the negligence wasn't so bad it was criminal even though of course it was negligent. And we also have a, a star case if you like of Misra and Strivastrava. In this case the patient died as a, as a result of the negligence of the two doctors and both were originally convicted of gross negligence manslaughter. Now in a strange appeal the, the defendants argued that their human rights had been breached by asking the jury to decide if their negligence was so bad it should be criminal. And what they're saying is, in essence, they would have been guilty of a crime that wasn't a crime before they did it because the jury are, in essence, creating a new crime every time they're deciding. Now, the House of Lords rejected this appeal and says what the jury are really doing is applying their behaviour to a pre-existing definition of a crime. So the appeal was rejected and, of course, this solidifies the idea that the jury just used their own view on what criminal is in, un in gross negligence manslaughter cases. So again once we've considered whether there is a duty of care and there's a breach of duty and indeed this breach has caused the death we then consider is negligence gross um, and again that's just a jury considering is it so bad it's criminal from Adam Arco. We need now to consider was there a risk of death at the time and if any of five of these are not satisfied then there will be no a not guilty verdict. So we are now going to consider whether there was a risk of death. Now in Adam Arco it wasn't totally clear that whether there was had to be a risk of death through the defendant's conduct or whether the risk needs only to be health or welfare because of the idea from previous cases. Now in Stone and Dobinson where the defendants had undertaken the care of Stone's sister the test was expressed as the risk being to health and welfare. So when Law Mackay gave judgment in Adamarco, he approved this way of explaining the matter 
However, Lord Mackay also approved the test in Bateman, where the test is disregard for life and safety of others. He also specifically mentioned the risk of death on two occasions in this judgment, and the matter has been resolved in Misrens River Strava. Now the Court of Appeal held Adam Marco clearly laid down the elements, so these five elements for this crime. The test in gross negligence manslaughter involves consideration of the risk of death, and it's not sufficient to show a risk of bodily injury or injury to health. And as we know already, the defendant's conviction for manslaughter was upheld in this case. But for this offence then, it must be an obvious risk of death and it's judged objectively. Now, of course, we know it is the jury who are going to judge it objectively, so that will always be the case. Now, as a matter of policy, the Crown Prosecution won't even prosecute for anything less than an obvious risk of death. Now, in Singh, a case we looked at earlier on, the trial judge jury uh, direction said a conviction would require circumstances such that a reasonably prudent person would have foreseen a serious and obvious risk, not of just injury or even serious injury, but of death. So now we know that's all we can have. It has to be risk of death or it's not gross negligence or manslaughter. So remember, all five elements need to be proven before you will be convicted of gross negligence manslaughter. Now, of course, it is just manslaughter you'll be convicted of. And again, the maximum sentence is life in prison. And you should outline that in any problem question. Thanks for watching.